Hi, glad you joined me. If you accept the proposition that there is an optimal debt ratio for a company, a right mix of debt and equity for every business, then the following question is, how do you come up with that mix? And one tool that we talked about in class was the cost of capital tool. And it's a very simple one. Basically, you look for that mix of debt and equity that minimizes your cost of capital. So in the standard cost of capital approach, what you accomplish by doing that is when you minimize your cost of capital, because you keep your cash flows fixed, you maximize your value as a business. In the more general, more enhanced approach, you allow for the fact that as your rating, as your default risk changes as a company, your operating income might change. Potentially, the optimal debt ratio then is not the one that minimizes your cost of capital, it's the one that maximizes your firm value. So what I thought I'd do is actually take you through my capital structure spreadsheet using Dell as my example to illustrate some of the inputs and also talk a little bit about some of the potential problems you might run into in getting these inputs for your company. Now, the reason I picked Dell, of course, it's the target of an acquisition bid by three different groups, two as of today, because Blackstone just dropped out. And all three groups are claiming that Dell can afford to borrow a lot more money, almost $9 billion. And one of the groups, Carl Icahn's group, actually wants Dell to borrow the money and pay a special dividend. Do a recap. So I thought it'd be interesting to see if Dell is, in fact, a company that can afford to carry this much additional debt. So I started with the spreadsheet, and the first two inputs were easy. I asked for the name of the company, Dell, of course, and ask you as of when, April of 2013. The reason I asked for the time is it's good to know when you did the spreadsheet because I do the spreadsheet six months from now for Dell. I might get a very different optimal debt ratio. Then I ask you for the numbers, and the numbers, of course, here have to come from the financial statements. So I went looking for the most recent financial statements I could find. In the case of Dell, I actually got lucky because the most recent financials are, are of um, February 1st, 2013. You can't get any more recent than that. And the income statement actually is on you know, pages 64 and after. Okay? So basically, it's on page 63. So the first input I ask you for is the uh, is the earnings before interest taxes, excuse me, earnings before interest expenses, depreciation, amortization, or the EBITDA number. Okay, so I I go back to the the report looking for EBITDA, and unfortunately Dell doesn't actually break out its EBITDA. It gives you the operating income three thousand and twelve, but it doesn't doesn't have an EBITDA line item. So let me highlight the three thousand and twelve because I need that. But I need the depreciation and amortization, but don't fear. The depreciation and amortization, even if it's not in the income statement, will always be in the statement of cash flows, and there it is, 1,144. If you add the 3,012 to the 1,144, you get 4,156, and that's my, that's my EBITDA to start the process. Okay. Next number I want is depreciation and amortization, which I just looked up. It's 1144, so I leave that as 1144. Then I ask you for capital spending. Stay on the statement of cash flows because that's where you'll find this item. And it's usually going to be under investing activities. And there are, there are there's actually a direct line item that says 512 million, right? 513 million, that's your capex. That's the accounting capex. Technically though, these acquisitions of 4,844 million are also capex. It's an open question as to whether Dell can keep doing those acquisitions going forward. So here I've left it at just the traditional capex, but that's a judgment call. If I were doing Cisco, which is a company that grows through acquisitions, I would add acquisitions to capex. Here I've chosen to take it out because I think going forward, Dell is going to kind of not do as many acquisitions or not do any acquisitions at all going forward. So that's a capex of 513 million. Then I then it asks for interest expenses. That should be easy, right? It should be right in the income statement. So I, let me go back to the income statement and here I run into a problem. There is an interest item, but it's a net interest item, 171 million. That doesn't help me. That's interest expense minus interest income. I want the gross interest expense and Sometimes you might not be able to find it, but in the case of Dell, there's a footnote, and I had to go looking through the footnotes to find it, but there's a footnote very late in the statement you now where they report the interest expense for the most recent year, 270 million. That's what I've entered. Now let's ask a word of question. What if you cannot find the interest expense? I've actually had companies where I cannot find the interest expense anywhere in the 10K. If you cannot find interest expense, here's the solution. Take the book value of debt that you're going to enter later, multiply it by a reasonable cost of debt. Now, whatever the pre-tax cost of debt you've assigned to the company is. So in this case, in the case of Dell, that'll be 9,085 million would be the book value of debt. The pre-tax cost of debt I estimated for Dell was 
I multiply 3.05% by 9,085, I'll get an estimated debt, which actually turns out to be very close to 270 million here. But whatever it works out to would be the number I interested as interest expense. So try that if you cannot find interest expense. Then I ask for a marginal tax rate to use in the cost of debt. Now some companies actually report a marginal tax rate and Dell happens to be one of them. So if I go to page 98, do you see a marginal tax rate reported of 35% for the US? The state taxes are only 0.9%. So let me update this number and make this 35.9% as my marginal tax rate. So we're getting down the sheet. So, so again, let me stop there. What if what if you cannot find a table like I did for Dell giving you a tax rate or marginal tax rate for your company? I've built in a marginal tax rate by country into the spreadsheet. Just look up the country in which your company is domiciled. Don't get tricky. Just use that tax rate as your marginal tax rate. So in the case of Dell, if I hadn't been able to find a tax rate in the 10K, I wouldn't have used the effective tax rate, which would have been in the 10K. I'd have gone into the table, looked up the marginal tax rate for the US, which happens to be 40% right there, okay? And use that as my tax rate for Dell. Then, then I ask you for a bond rating. Now, some of your companies have actual bond ratings. If you have an actual bond rating, enter that number. Dell does have an actual bond rating of A minus. And the default spread for an A minus rated bond is 1.3 percent. I add that to the risk-free rate, which at the time of this analysis was 1.75 percent to get a pre-tax cost of debt of 3.05 percent. I'm almost set. Then come some numbers where I have to go out of the annual report of the 10k. I want the number of shares outstanding as of right now and the market price as of right now. These numbers I just went to Yahoo Finance, found Dell, looked up the number of shares and the share price and entered those numbers in. Because I want updated numbers. Those are the two numbers. Then I want a beta for the stock. If I'm in Yahoo Finance, there's a beta right there, right? But that's a regression beta. If you're desperate, use that number. But if you've done this analysis after you've done a bottom-up bottom beta for your company, there should be a way in which you can get a much better estimate of your beta, and that would be a bottom-up beta. In the case of Dell, it's in only one business, computer peripherals, so I use the bottom-up beta. Now, you might disagree with me on this one and say, look, it's in two businesses, computer services, if you feel that Dell is in two or three businesses, then break the revenues down by business, take a weighted average bottom-up beta. That's still an unlevered beta. I use the market debt and equity that Dell has to come up with a levered beta. I know that, that again, this requires that you've done your homework, but if you haven't done your homework, basically you know, use an estimate of the, of the debt to equity to get started. But that's the 1.74 beta. It's a bottom-up levered beta for my stock. Then I ask for a book value of debt. That again is going to be in the financials. So I go back to the financials to page, I think 65. Let's see if I guessed right. No, that's a statement of cash flows. Statement of income. Ah, oh, there we go. Statement of liabilities and shareholders equity. There, the two items I'm going to pick are short-term debt and long-term debt. 3,843 plus 5,242 is the 9,085 million that I've entered there. That's a book value of debt. Then I ask you whether you can estimate the market value of debt. For those of you who've actually done your own estimation of the market value of just the interest-bearing debt, you can say no, yes to this question and actually enter the market value of debt directly. Remember not to include the present value of leases because we're going to add that on, so you don't want to double count it. So this is just the market value of your interest-bearing debt if you have it. You're saying, what if I haven't done that yet? Not a problem. Just say, do you want me to try and estimate this? Just say yes to it and enter the weighted maturity. Now that again will require that you go to the 10K. And in the case of Dell, the weighted maturity is on page 82 of the 10K, and you see the debt broken down. And they're actually very good. They break down all $9,085 million of debt by when the debt comes due. I put those all into a spreadsheet, and you'll see that spreadsheet built in here and to come up with a weighted average. So basically, you see the amount of debt due in each period, including the short term debt, take a weighted maturity of 4.44 years. So you put that into your inputs as the weighted maturity of debt, 4.44 years. Then I ask you, do you have any operating leases? If you say yes, please go in and update the numbers in the lease spreadsheet. Otherwise, I'll be using whatever numbers were in there already, and you don't want that to happen. And De Dell doesn't have very much in leases, but it does have some leases, and they're on page 93 of the 10K. 
and you can see them listed there and the current year's lease expense is also listed 137 million that's what I transferred into the lease table okay I know you're getting impatient but we're pretty much to the end there so basically we have leases enter yes enter the lease ex commitments each year then then I ask then I open up the door to indirect bankruptcy costs let me explain as I said in the standard cost to capital approach I keep operating income fixed while I change the debt ratio so your rating could go from triple A down to single C and your operating income stays what it is, which is a little unrealistic because if your rating drops, especially below investment grade, you're probably going to lose some revenues, your costs are going to go up. So this is your chance to bring in indirect bankruptcy costs. If you say yes to that, then I give you a choice of whether you want those costs to be high, medium or low. You're saying, how do I pay? If your company has a lot of pr products which are really long-term products which require servicing, then the indirect bankruptcy costs are probably going to be high. So for example, Boeing, high indirect bankruptcy costs. Grocery store, low indirect bankruptcy costs. I'm going to leave it at low for Dell because as a customer, I mean, if I've never bought a Dell computer, but if I did buy, buy a Dell computer, I'm not particularly concerned about Dell being around because my computer is probably going to last less than less time than Dell will, especially if it's a Dell computer. And I, and I don't mean my biases to show, but I'm going to leave it at low. The next question I ask you is for a risk-free rate. Well, in whatever currency you're doing the analysis, and that's key. Here I'm doing my analysis in, in US dollars, so I use the T-bond rate as my risk-free rate. If I were doing my analysis in euros, this would be the German euro bond rate. If I were doing my analysis in rupees, it would not be the Indian government bond rate in rupees. It would be that rate net of the default spread for the Indian government. We've gone through this process before, but the risk-free rate there should be a true risk-free rate. Then the next question I ask you is for the equity risk premium. Now, I could be sloppy and just use the equity risk premium, the company in which the country, the, the country in which the company is incorporated, which for Dell would be the U.S., but I decided to do it right by breaking down their revenues. And again, I found this information in the 10K. It wasn't very good, to be quite honest, because they did break down their revenues geographically, but the revenue breakdown was not very detailed. In fact, it was... But half the revenues come from the U.S., half from foreign countries, whatever that means. You know, it could be Brazil, it could be the U Germany, it could be the U.K., it could be China. So I wasn't sure what it was, but I decided to make some guesses. And you can disagree with me on these guesses and change them if you want. That's a choice you can make. But I assume that the U.S. revenues are going to North America. The, the rest of the revenues are broken down as follows. That... A quarter of the revenues come from Asia, or half of the non-U.S. revenues come from Asia. A third come from Western Europe, and, a, and the rest come from Central and South America. As I said, your guess is as good as mine. Absent information, I thought that was as good as I could do. And that gives me an equity risk premium, a weighted average equity risk premium, based upon that breakdown of 6.7092% or 6.71%. So let me go back to the input page because that's what you're going to see as my risk premium of 6.71%. Then I ask you for a country default spread. You're saying, what the heck is that? Remember, I, you know, if, you're, if we talked about the risk-free rate in a currency where the government has default risk. We talked about India potentially having default risk. Let's assume the Indian government bond rate in rupees was 8%. And the Indian default spread was 2%. I'm going to take 8 minus 2 and enter 6% as my risk-free rate in rupees. So that's what you'd see as my risk-free rate. Here, are the country default spread, I would enter the 2%. Why do I need that? If your company is incorporated in a country with default risk, I'm going to add the default spread onto the cost of debt at every debt ratio. Of course, for, the US, for a U.S. company, for the moment at least, this is 0%, so I've left it at 0. Then come the last three inputs. There are two separate tables I allow you to use. One for large companies, large market cap companies, where market cap greater than $5 billion is large and less than $5 billion is small. And two for smaller or riskier companies. Keyword there is or. So if you have a $20 billion really risky company, you could you could enter two. I mean, there's nothing that stops you from doing that. In fact, I considered using two for Dell, but I left finally chose to leave it at, at one because it, it's in a pretty mature business right now. It's not going to get much growth. And so, again, that's open to questions. So I've left it at one. And then here are the last two questions. I ask you, do you want to assume that the existing debt is refinanced at the new rate? You're saying, what the heck are you talking about? Remember, as you increase your debt ratio, your rating might drop. If your rating drops, here's what I do in the spreadsheet. I take all of your existing debt, not just the new debt, all of the existing debt, 
and assume it gets refinanced at the new cost of debt, which might be much higher than your existing cost of debt. I do that partly to be conservative and partly because this old debt is going to come due at some point in time, and when it comes due, you have to pay the higher rate. Now, some companies might have really long-term old debt where they're not forced to repay the debt or re refinance the debt at the new rate. That gives them an advantage because they can keep that debt at the old rate for a long time. If your company is one of those companies, which is going to be unusual, but if, if your company is one of those companies, you can change the answer here to no. And if you change it to no, then all of your existing debt is going to stay on at the old rate, so which will keep your interest expenses lower than it otherwise would have, and it'll push up your optimal. The last question matters only if you have an actual rating, as for Dell. If you say yes to the last question, what I will do is I will replace the actual rating with the synthetic rating. Dell's synthetic rating actually is AAA. So if I said yes to that question, the cost of debt for Dell will go to the cost, cost of debt for a AAA rating. I'm not going to do that for Dell, but for some companies, you might choose to do it. That's pretty much it. I have all the inputs. I'm curious. Let's see what the optimal capital structure is. Based on those inputs, the optimal capital structure I come up with is 50%. Okay, what's driving it? One is the marginal tax rate being 35.9%, which is high, not by U.S. standards, but relative to other companies. The second is, if you look at their EBITDA right now, their EBITDA as a percentage of their firm value, the 4,173 divided by the market value of equity plus debt, you know, so which is about $33.5 billion, gives me about 12%. So that's a, that's a pretty high number. For every dollar in value, about $12 comes out as cash flows. It allows me to, so one reason I'm able to service so much debt is I have a lot of cash flows coming from existing businesses. So the tax rate matters, the cash flows matter. It's a risky business. The unlevered beta is a pretty high beta. Yeah? So those things all feed into the optimal and changing any of those numbers will change my optimal. Just as a what if. If Dell were able to make its marginal tax rate go to 0%, for instance, what do you think is going to happen? Let's make that 0%. Let's see what happens to the optimal. Voila. The optimal debt ratio goes to 0%. Play with the tax rate. See what happens. Play with the EBITDA. Change the EBITDA and see. And as the EBITDA goes down, you'll see the optimal debt ratio go down. Notice also that because the rating for Dell, and you can see the rating at different debt ratios, stays high pretty much all the way through, the indirect bankruptcy costs really don't kick in significantly. But for some of your companies, the indirect bankruptcy costs can be an issue, which means that what you see as the optimal might be at a point where your cost of capital is not minimized, but your firm value will be maximized. So keep your eyes on the firm value because that's what we're maximizing. If you have indirect bankruptcy costs, it's a firm value that's being maximized, not the cost of capital being minimized. If you, if you have no indirect bankruptcy cost, it'll always be where your cost of capital is minimized. For some of your companies, and this is the last thing I want to say, you might find a strange output. Your current debt ratio and cost, the cost of capital to current debt ratio can actually be lower than the cost of capital you get at the optimal. You're saying, what the heck is going on? I thought the optimal was always going to be the point at which my cost of capital is minimized. This can happen for a couple of reasons. One is, I move in 10% increments. So let's suppose that your actual debt ratio is 16%. Okay? And I tell you that the optimal is 20%. Remember, I, I tried 0, 10, 20. 20 at a lower cost of capital. But your true optimal might be 17.2%. In which case, you're actually closer to the optimal at your current debt ratio than you are at my artificial optimal. So if you're when you get an optimal uh, cost of capital at your optimal that's slightly higher than the cost of capital at the current debt ratio, it might be that you're already at the optimal. The other is the fact that I use synthetic rating to compute the cost of capital at every debt ratio, whereas you might be using an actual rating to compute the actual current cost of capital. If those two ratings are at war with each other, especially if the actual rating is higher than the synthetic rating, you could end up with an optimal cost of capital that is higher than the current cost of capital. Okay. What can you do to fix it? Remember that option I gave you of changing the actual rating to a synthetic rating? Try that out. Go back and say that you want to change the actual ratings to synthetic rating. The problem might go away. Talked a little bit more about under the FAQ worksheet in this spreadsheet. So give that a, give that a try. But that's pretty much all I wanted to say. I hope you get a chance to try this spreadsheet out in your company. As you can see, it's not a lot of input, so it shouldn't be too much work. And I'll be interested to see what the optimal debt ratio for your company is. Thank you for listening.